Welcome to the Power Cat Podcast, the original K-State sports show. Now let's go to the rolling Flint Hills, home of the Cats and Dogs studio. Here's your host, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to another edition of the Power Cat Podcast. Fitz and Gills looking all skinny on the sides. It's the only time I've ever been described as that. Cole in the middle, and uh, that's Daphne. The dude's back on the couch as we've added the Cats and Dogs studio cam. Uh, that's pretty much uh, what they do, unless they're barking in the background. That's it. We're sponsored by the Fridge Wholesale Liquor. They're never barking in the background. They only bark in the foreground. I don't know what that means, but I got might mute my computer here. Uh, make sure you stop in the fridge whenever you're into town. It's a wonderful place. It's like uh, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, but it's uh, Kevin's Magical Booze Factory. Uh, so it's for adults, and all of his Oompa Loompas will help you out. Boy, I, that that was the worst read I've ever done for them. But it wasn't even really a read. It was like a uh, kind of an LSD thing, just flashing back to my days as a hippie we went from chocolate to the fridge to lsd and we're only a minute into the podcast this is my third media thing today of five so you get semi loopy fits um ww will get full loopy fits and then uh the cincinnati 24 7 site's gonna get a crap show fits Daphne's on the move Watching on YouTube, real quick, Fitz. It looks like you have a mohawk on the cats and dogs camera. Now move your head back up a little bit. Down, oh. this is down, Dad. See it? Yeah, it's the, uh, it's the the. What is that? It's one of the. I don't know. It's just the way it's. Uh, oh, it's the, oh, it's the edge of the print. It's the edge of the. Okay. Nichols Hall That's print. That's hilarious. Right there. If you had hair, you should you should definitely go for a mohawk. If if your hair comes back. I'd have a mohawk with a pause in the middle. I'd just have like a hawk, pause, hawk. Hmm. That's it. That's it for the podcast. It's been great talking to you. I hope you learned a lot about K-State sports. Uh, we're going to get you. You can't blame cancer for, right, Fitz? What? Not having hair? No, no, no. That's all natural. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I could have hair. I've just opted not to have it. It would just be weird. I could do a big comb over. It'd be anyhow. Let's get on with the podcast. Cole's it's picked the idea. questions, so Cole's is going. Cole's is Cole is going to read the questions. Gilbert and I have no idea what's coming next in terms of what the questions will be, and the dogs never have a clue about anything other than they want treats. They didn't react. That's good. Here's your questions from All Bass Station. Cole, take it away. First question of the podcast comes from El Camino Cat. The hype around Avery Johnson. Has there ever been a K-State player in a similar situation in terms of expectation versus experience? For the sake of this question, guys, I'm going to um, allow it to be more than just football because I think we have our, all three of us will have the same answer if we open it up to just more than football. Yes, you are right. Michael Beasley. Um, yeah, and he was worth the hype and we knew he would be. And but in the football realm, yeah, no, no one ever close because as we've moved into this higher visibility of recruits, you, know, you, yeah. you would get a guy that was maybe really good, not this good, but you still wouldn't know. I mean, but now recruits are so closely evaluated and they kind of all have matching ratings across the, the networks. It was up there. And then you add in the fact that he's had a year of practice. People have seen him. And nobody is saying slow down. That is the most telling thing. If you listen to Life of Fitz podcast, Joe Klanerman went on for quite a bit about what Avery does for the team, what he is as a player, how he makes the defense better, and how he is as a leader um, on that team. And it's really interesting stuff. That's right at the end of that podcast. Gilbert, I, I want to hear you talk about Michael Beasley before I talk about Avery Johnson. I mean, I just... Michael Beasley was a terrific player, obviously, and I'm sure there was some hype. I was kind of right on the cusp of really remembering my days as an early K-State fan, but social media hadn't taken off yet, right? And that's part of what's making the whole Avery Johnson stuff so exciting is that, you know, there's just a palpable buzz on social media, on the YouTube channel, on the message boards, all that stuff. I know that was there in the past, but 
it just feels different this time. And so with football specifically, no, I can't remember anything. Um, <clears throat> guys, honestly, the closest thing that that comes to mind is Dylan Edwards when he initially <laughs> had committed, right? And before all that stuff went south for a little bit, there was a, a huge buzz there. And it just matters so much for these guys to be in-state players. Now, Lincoln Cure obviously isn't as, uh, you know, am- animated, I guess, or flashy as Avery Johnson, yeah. but he's still a heck of an athlete. So all that stuff kind of just comes together for Avery Johnson. I would also say it's because of the position he plays, guys. Sure. Um, it's the quarterback position, right? Like, you know, for basketball, it's easy because, you know, you, there's only five guys on the court. So one guy can really stand out. For football, it's so difficult for one person to stand out um, unless you're the quarterback. And Avery Johnson just so happens to be the quarterback. He's got long, blonde hair. He's from Kansas. He can. Uh, he's the fastest player on the team. And to go along with that, we've heard about his passing abilities through the coaching staff. So, uh, yeah, it's a weird – It's it's kind of a weird situation, right? Because, no, I can't remember any player – that has as little experience and as high as expectations. Now, I, I'm of the belief that those expectations are um, not too high, right? Like a lot of the times we'll have expectations for players. Players have expectations expectations for themselves, and their expectations might be a little too high. But, you know, if anything, guys, I think we're underselling Avery Johnson a little bit just because of the potential that he possesses yep. simply due to all of the intangibles he has. Yeah, I agree with all that. Uh, what do you guys think of this plan? I just thought of this. I, I, I think uh, I've seen Michael Beasley on a few podcasts or shows where uh, he's not very good, you know, kind of incoherent, and other ones where he's absolutely brilliant. And um, what if I recorded an episode? I went out to Colorado and recorded an episode where we were both totally baked. That would just be amazing. Totally, yeah, he's more used to it than me, but that would be, I'd probably still get fired from everything. I don't know. I never thought I'd share this with Michael Beasley. Okay. We got some more work it for you if you want me to. I'll try my best to make it happen. You know, we I don't have to go to Colorado. We could do it while I'm in Vegas. Because well, my, ex- my expectations for that podcast would be extremely high. I love you guys it. better be talking about SpongeBob. I love it. Oh, I know. Yes. I don't know my SpongeBob very well. Well, Beasley Y'all loves SpongeBob. Kind of adds up. I don't even sure he he actually watched SpongeBob or was just so high he thought he was. But that's I love the dude, man. I freaking love him. He's one of a kind. All right. Switch Are gears we... real quick off yeah. of the off of whatever that was for the last thirty seconds. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's a good thing that you know Jerome Tang, especially for basketball. I don't know football um, is with this a little bit, but embracing social media and and realizing that that kind of has an impact on the fans you know, presence and stuff. I was, I was thinking here for the last couple of minutes of any sort of Bruce Weber player that had this much hype. And obviously it's, did Bruce Weber get a, a player as good as Avery Johnson? You know, were they a five-star, four-star, you know, he had a few Nigel pack. There was buzz for a few guys here and there, but ultimately I don't think that buzz was there just because that that staff didn't really have any care for social media. That's not a bad thing, right? They're focused on other things, but Jerome Tang certainly has embraced this social media stuff. He's active on it all the time. His entire coaching staff is as well. And so with basketball, I mean, we're getting some buzz with these transfer portal players, not necessarily guys that come from the high school ranks. So have we seen them do anything in a purple jersey yet? No, but I think it's kind of unfair to compare him to Avery, to compare any of these guys from the portal with Avery Johnson, just because they have collegiate experience. They've been guys that are averaging double figures a game and so bottom line here my main point was just that you know this basketball staff and football does it as well you know social media and not just the staff but k-state athletics as a whole there's such a a push you know they make it an emphasis to to have these hype videos and all all sorts of things you guys have seen it and so that all that stuff matters to to not only getting those players to manhattan but obviously having fans excited for them as well you know i think Dean Wade would be the only one who approached it as a Kansan that was really highly regarded. But again, you're right. It wasn't quite the same social media frenzy. You look at great players like Nigel Pack and Barry Brown, they were kind of, they, they honestly, they matured into that under that coaching staff. Uh, they blossomed. Barry was nowhere near that and then just kind of erupted. So Nigel just turned out to be really good. 
So yeah, I think this is exactly right. There's not been nothing like it. Nope. So uh, keeping along the same lines, we saw Avery Johnson. The, f- the first time we saw Avery Johnson was in the first game of the season last year. Uh, this next question comes from the real Z cat Mandu. I don't know if this is a new person or not. I haven't Ooh. heard this name in a while. Um, he, he asked which freshman and or how many see the field in Manhattan that first game, assuming you think it's going to be a blowout that allows a lot of players to take a few snaps. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't Which is a really thought. good question. That's just why I put it in here, because think about how many true freshmen we saw last year take snaps in week one. Uh, top of my head, I can think of Avery Johnson. I can think of Trey Spivey, Kanigel Thomas. Um, Chidi Obi Izar got some snaps in that game. There was a bunch of the guys that you kind of saw their plan uh, for those true freshmen. Hey, we're going to redshirt you, but we want to get you some time. And I think those are the guys that they're talking about now as redshirt freshmen that are going to be contributors. So uh, it's definitely something to watch. Uh, I'm sure we can pull up the the list here in a little bit. But like, I mean, if you see a guy play in that first game of the season there's a good chance that you're going to see him very, very heavily either in that first year or in the second year as a redshirt freshman. I, I, would you guys agree with that? Well, I can't think of a position where they really need to build depth through a freshman. I mean, D line has got depth to it. Linebackers certainly have, has plenty of depth where they had to use freshmen last year. Um, safeties and corners seem pretty good. I, I don't, you know, offensive lines being rebuilt, but you're not going to play a true freshman there. Receivers are restocked. Running back is really good now. Quarterback, um, someone's going to have to see the field in relief. But uh, unlike last year where you wanted to see Avery, you wanted to let him get out there and perform, uh, I think in this game you might put him, take him out late, but you really want him to get in as many snaps as possible with keeping him safe. Gilbert, what do you think? I just I think if you're a K-State fan, right, you hope that you get to see a lot of freshmen, right? If you're not in a blowout against UT Martin, that might not not be the yeah. best. So you want to see those freshmen. Obviously, it it's beneficial for those guys to get some minutes. And obviously, you know, the plan might be there to redshirt a number of those players. But that that little series here, that snap there can go a long ways for the future of, of their development. It really can. Yeah, I'm going to call my shot here. Um, looking at our database that has the eight early enrollees, um, AKA guys who've been here since the spring. If I, as, as I look through this, Jacquez Bradley Dimps to me, the receiver out of Pflugerville, Texas is probably a guy that you would think, um, would, would see some kind of time. Um, again, kind of that same arc as Trace Spivey. Um, they like to get those receivers in there just to kind of show them, Hey, this is what the speed of the game is going to be like. And guys, let's think about it like this too. If they plan on wanting to keep these guys around, there is going to have to be some, hey, you're a part of our future, but you're also a part of our present, right? And so you have to kind of show these kids with the day and age of the transfer portal, this is what the vision is. And while you might only get in two or three games, this is how we're going to use you. We're not just going to tell you. We're going to actually show you yeah. on the field when we can get you in. And so um, I see Jacquez Bradley Dimps. Um, Colin Barta from Topeka Seaman is another guy at the safety position. Really, any position where you can get two or three guys of the same position group on the field at the same time is probably your best bet. I know we talked about offensive linemen. That probably won't happen. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't shock me if Trey Davis, another receiver, would be a, a candidate to, to see some playing time. Um, you know, there's going to be a few. There's not going to be as many as the year before, um, but – it wouldn't shock me to see probably three or four true freshmen find a way to get in in garbage time. And um, yeah. especially if they're not going to be contributors, right? Because yeah. you can, you can play those games and not have to redshirt. A lot, a lot might be tested out on special teams to see if uh, they're ready for that can play at that right. speed and that physicality. Uh, that's usually where they do that in these games. So we'll see. That's a, it's a great question. And one that certainly that warrants watching next, uh, next game which is a long ways away. Is it's it a long really ways not. away? It's no. like two months and a week. No. It's August 31st. Today is what, June 26th? Yeah. If we were to put that in context, that's like week one, and then it would be what, like week seven? Is that right? It's Something crazy. like that? Yeah. Uh, 
uh, the new members are joining on next Monday, and I haven't bought any gifts yet. Mm. Uh, they I'll probably just send you talk to the Are they? What's that? They're not going to give us any gifts, are they? Well, they're, they're new to the family. I'm going to just send the Utah fans a bunch of salt because they're very salty. Um, but yeah, no, it's I'm I'm looking forward to that first game because a lot of these questions. Mm-hmm. No doubt. The next question comes from Adam BT. How excited should we be about football recruiting? He he says, are we doing good compared to our peers, or are we just doing good compared to our low expectations? As of now, yes. Then the second one, uh, I think Lincoln Cure and you know maybe a few other guys will raise that up um, if they can secure him when he announces. You know, um, they're they're recruiting guys that fit their system, and it's always worked at K state and continues to work for Chris Kleiman and, and staff. So uh, it's cool to get a five-star guy, but I, I mean, I would argue Avery Johnson's a five-star quarterback and he wasn't. So it's, you know, it's kind of a cycle. There's only so many five stars in a class. It's a set number. So you can have really good five stars and guys that would be in most years, but yeah, I think we'll see how this class pans out as a whole. But I see Kansas State competing with uh, peer institutions a lot lately, uh, and even above. If you you know want to look at some of the power Big Ten or SEC schools, if you beat Oregon and A and M for Lincoln Cure, uh, you know it, that's that's that says something because they're throwing a lot of you know a lot of power at him. A lot of I don't know about money, but certainly they're they're able to put on a big show and they talk big stuff about the Big Twelve falling apart. But we'll see how that all plays out. It's weird, right? Because I feel like, you know, people think about recruiting um, in different ways. You know, there's the one fan who says, okay, when I think about recruiting, I think about how I used to play NCAA football 12 or how I'm going to play EA Sports College football 25, where you just see the top 200 guys on the board and you just favorite every single one of them and you try and recruit them no matter where they are, no matter what position they are. Right. There's a lot of us who when we played that video game as a kid, that's what we did. I'm guilty of it. But you can't think about recruiting like that, right? Like if K State were to do that, they would not be very successful. No. They just wouldn't. Now, can they do that with a top 20 kid in Lincoln Cure who is from the state of Kansas, who already likes your school, already likes your program? Yes, you can. But really, where you want to beat out teams, right? And, and when you talk about compared to low expectations, I don't think it's low expectations as it is picking out guys who are fits for your program and guys you know that you can get right? Is it possible K-State could get a five-star every single class? Well, it's just like what Jerome Tang tries to do in basketball. The more you go after them, the more you're going to get rejected, but the better odds you are that you're actually going to land one. If you only go after one every single year, you're not going to have as much of a chance to get it, to get him as you would if you were to go after 10. But for K-State strategy, it's like, well, there's no point of going after the 10 if we're going to put all of our time and energy into that player mm-hmm. when we can go get other players who are very attainable while simultaneously building that program up. I'm hoping yeah. that makes sense. Uh, it does. It does. And, you know, another factor is your NIL budget. And Chris Kleiman has wisely focused that on roster retention. Prove it and get the money. Uh, so that's going to impact your ability to attract a lot of these five stars because they're so often money motivated. And let's be blunt. Kansas State football isn't going to outbid half of the SEC or half of the Big Ten for a player. They're just not. There's huge NIL budgets in place. So uh, I think it's a wise wise thing to do is once they prove it, then they get paid. And lo and behold, you get a guy like Lincoln Cure who says NIL is not really a factor. Uh, so he fits into your budget a little more, but he will get really paid if he turns out to be what we think he is, just like Avery has. No doubt. Just, uh, just to piggyback off of off of you, Cole. There's a there's a middle ground of putting all your eggs in one basket, <clears throat> excuse me, and also throwing darts at the dartboard and just going after everybody. And so I feel like that's right. both true for for basketball and football that you have to find that balance. Yep, agreed. A little bit of breaking news here on the podcast, by the way. Okay. Uh, Jaden Woods is the number four player in the state of Kansas in the class of 2025. Has just committed to Penn State. So when you see this podcast, that will be old news. But now you have Dawson Merritt, the number three player in the state, commit to Alabama, the number four player in the state, Jaden Woods, 
commit to Penn State with the number one and number two players in the state of Kansas. Both five-star recruits still uncommitted. So we talk about the talent in this state um, definitely increasing. We talk about expectations when it comes to the recruiting class kind of goes along the lines of what we were talking about. Um, These are really talented players who K-State has a chance with. But again, you're not going to win every single recruiting battle, even in your own state. So that's why if K-State is able to secure that um, commitment from Lincoln Cure, I think it would be a really big deal. It's of note that I think programs have come to realize there's dudes in Kansas and K-State's mm-hmm. been getting them for free. We better go in and take a look. Yep, no doubt about it. Um, last question of the first half comes from King Jim 77 He says, discuss the EA Sports list of toughest stadiums to play that only featured one Big 12 school. Is that more Big 10 and SEC bias? Now, fellas, I don't know if you had a chance to check this list out. If you have not... <coughs> And I need to do a little exercise and read you the list. Let me know. But I will tell you that it is uh, fairly disappointing as far as a Big 12 perspective goes. I I guess my question, my only curiosity is how they build this list. It's some dork in a, you know, in a studio in California come up with this. I mean, some guy that watches mostly F1 and soccer. Sorry, Zach. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Did he come up with this list? Because apparently whoever came up with the list has never gone to a college football stadium. They, you know, it's just crazy. It, yeah, I think they lead into big venues being the best venues, and that is not true in college football. Not even close. I would take three stadiums, uh, not including Oklahoma, I would take over the Texas Longhorn Stadium. That Memorial Stadium is enormous, 100K. And I, I would think that uh, K-State, Iowa State, and Oklahoma State all have tougher venues in which to play. Yeah. And if okay. not more. But the, this is, I, I don't know, you can put West Virginia up there. It is not a tough venue. But I think, were they in the top 25? West Virginia was not. No, Texas. Oh, Texas, yes. Texas was number 19. What a, what a complete joke. That is not a tough environment. That, that isn't a tough environment. People go in there and beat Texas, and they never play their toughest rival, Oklahoma, so we don't really have that to measure it with. That's that's just picking stadiums based on size. And, again, that was probably just some kid that uh, probably – I'm not going to get into it. I'm not, I'm not going to insult the kid. Maybe he's a nice kid. Idiot. Uh, Only Gilbert, the issue I had, guys, was yeah. Boise State. Like, yes. That was the one school I looked at. I just – that's a, that's gotta be a joke. Boise state at number 24, Boise state at number 24. Um, I, I also will say this Donald W Reynolds Razorback stadium at number 23. Really? We're putting Arkansas in the top 25, a program that hasn't been yeah, bowl you gotta be good. in how many years? You gotta like, be good. What? Yeah. Well, how, how great's your stadium if you get beat in it all the time? They don't even fill it up. Like I mean, they don't even are, fill that stadium up. Mountain West people are like, Boise is okay, but it's not the best in the, Mountain West. Yeah. You don't want to go to Wyoming as Oklahoma State found out. It's it's crazy. Oh well. Uh you dorks enjoy that game. I'll be doing more mature things. No, you won't. I also, won't. No, I just did won't you know that Oklahoma. Mississippi State Stadium is Davis Wade Stadium? I wonder yeah. if there's a I wonder if there's a Holland Gregg Stadium anywhere in uh You went Charlotte. for that one, didn't you? Herrera Kelvin <laughs> Stadium. <laughs> Please tell me Mississippi State isn't on that list, is it? No, they are. They're number twenty-five. You, I don't. So you was that twenty nineteen? Fitz, did you go to that trip? No, I. That was not long okay. after my diagnosis, so I didn't. Okay. But the boys said it wasn't very intimidating, and K State won in there. What are we also, doing? I think I also will. I also will have a beef with the, actually with the top ten um, stadium in here. Uh, I, I don't know how Autzen Stadium number eleven is Oregon, and Gaylord Family Oklahoma Memorial Stadium is number eight. You cannot tell me that Oregon is a less tough place to play than Oklahoma. Having been to the Oklahoma game, I've been to multiple Oklahoma games. I've not been to an Oregon game, but I've seen how Oregon plays in that stadium. Give me Oregon over Oklahoma I every agree. single day. I mean, they say Oklahoma never loses at home. Well. They lose to K State and they don't play yeah. their biggest rivals. Mm-hmm. I mean, do we really know? Don't just give them credit for being a tough place to play because they never play their biggest game of the season there. And I don't know. 
And Mike Gundy yeah. doesn't know how to win in Norman. Uh, what do you guys think is number one in the country? The toughest place. I don't have a good answer. I'm curious what you guys think. I'm, it's not Kyle Field, which was number one in, on this yeah, list, agree. which is just ridiculous. What? <laughs> I guess I should have read. Do you want me to just to read you the top? No, 10? I, I, no, I don't want to be that angry. I want to go to break and try to cleanse my mind that we ever talked about this. What, man? That's this is like junk food. You eat you eat crappy food and you feel crappy. I feel crappy about this game. I, I'm sorry that children are going to waste their money on this game when they could be doing something like playing. Some we will be, be talking something about like this game. eating junk food. Exactly. Exactly. We will be talking about this game, by the way. Like when the player ratings come out, there will be a question who was overrated and who was underrated on K State. And I'll put it in there just because it's good stuff to debate about. Look, here's what I want you to do I want you guys to have a podcast. If Joe Tillery plays a game, Scott Wildcat plays, a game, you bring in other experts. I don't care. Leave me out of this. <laughs> I don't want to talk about this. I'm not no, a person no. who lives in reality, but that's not a reality I ever want to visit is playing that video game all day long. Cause I would, I would just, I would totally forget everything else and just play that video game. That's it. I've had it with this podcast. Uh, we're going to break. If I can find my, my thing here, we're going to go to break. And on the other side, we're going to take more questions. Cole is going to keep reading these questions. And if there's any more about EA sports, Cole is not going to be reading the questions. Gills and I will be talking about other things without Cole. We'll be right back. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Please visit the fridge wholesale liquor located at the corner of Claflin and Westport road in Manhattan, Kansas. Welcome back to the show. Let's return to the Cats and Dog Studio. Welcome back to the Power Cat Podcast. Fitz and Gills and Coles right here in the studios. Uh, hey, remember when we used to take a break in between the the two halves because we were just recording, and then we, we like forty five minutes later, we're like, oh crap, we should probably record the other rest of the podcast. We don't do that anymore because as we much go, as I love chit chatting, man, I'm kind of glad we just go straight through now don't we i know it's kind of efficient makes it yeah. easier on me and i think we all need to approach life with this thought what makes it easier on fits for example they do that at the fridge wholesale liquor they get all the things i love for partying with except for gills he's not on sale there and I, I do love partying with gills um and they put it all in one store if it's Woodford, they've got it. If it's Absolute Citron, they've got it. By the way, you manly men who enjoy fruity vodkas like me, uh, Absolute Wild Berry is absolutely incredible. They have it at the fridge. Don't buy it all. I want some. Get into the fridge at the corner of this and that in the town in which we live. Football season's nearly here, and you need to go to the fridge. I think they made up for the first half. That was good. The absolute pear and banana puree and ice. Is that available at the fridge? No, no. You want, you want to know who you want to name that drink and who, who, uh, who named it? No, I think the creator of the drink should share that with the audience. Uh, no, they won't believe I created it. Uh, it's got the banana hammock available at the bar that he works at, but we invented that before the pandemic and nobody drank it. And then after the pandemic, someone found the recipe somewhere and all of a sudden it's a big deal. It's a banana with the pear. It's a banana hammock. What you think Are we ready that? for the questions? We need, we need them real quick now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a really long question, but it's a really good uh, question. I miss the days where we didn't have the, uh, the camera so I could sit here, struggle away and read the question and actually not have to pretend like I'm not reading off the screen. That's right in front of me, okay. but here we are from cat and Kahlo. with conference expansion. The difficulty of the conference football schedules varies dramatically among big 12 schools based on who you don't play in home and away games. In a league with lots of parity and no dominant teams, I worry that the conference championship participants will be de will be determined as much by the luck of scheduling versus the quality of the team. This is not a good recipe for sending our best to the 12 team playoff. What say you? Are there any changes that can be made? Well, I think that's 
Well, that's been true for every conference, particularly if you were, I mean, if you were in the Big 12 or Big 10 West, you could win 10 games and be crappy. Hello, Iowa. I'm talking about you. Um, but I don't, I think the parity in this conference will balance that out uh, to a degree. Uh, you look at West Virginia last year, they had a much better season than expected, but a lot of that was due to maybe the schedule. And we pretend to know what teams are going to be like going into the year, but do we? I mean, do we really understand who's got the good schedules and the weak schedules? Everyone says Utah has a, a soft schedule. Well, let's see what the teams are about. This conference is so volatile on an annual basis. Teams rise and fall with against expectation all the time. Uh, and, you know, Kansas supposedly has a really tough schedule. Well, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I, I just I want to play games. I want to get on the field and see where this conference measures up team by team against each other because I don't know right now. This is the most unsettled I've ever felt about trying to pick the Big 12 in my entire career because half of the 16 teams have came in a year ago or in a few days. So it's it's really hard to understand where these teams sit and honestly Oklahoma was always the standard bearer and Texas was always someone you could measure against and have a real feel for the conference. Now that's all gone, and we just got to find our way after this. We can't, we cannot base our judgment for this year off of our, our off of the results of last year, right? Like that is to me the biggest takeaway about the Big Twelve. You cannot sit here and say, "Oh, Oklahoma State's going to be really good because they made the Big Twelve championship game," or "Oh, K State, they're going to be really good because look what they did. They won the Pop Tarts Bowl. They won however many games. They won nine games." Like. No, you have to look at what each team has. You cannot base last year to this year simply because right. the dynamics are completely different, right? Like, Rangers. oh, you, can, you cannot take the results of last year. Oh, well, K-State beat this team, and that team lost to this team, which makes K-State better. It, it, does, it doesn't work like that. You know, it, with so many teams, it really is just going to be, let's roll the ball out there, and whoever has the best record, you're going to play in the championship game. If you're yep. not the best team, it is what it is. But if you are the best team, you will win those games. <laughs> It'll it will show because you will get to the playoff and you will be substantially better than whoever else would have made the playoff. I mean, Fitz, we did a show on on the Big Twelve Insiders a month or two back about the Big Twelve and sort of the betting stuff, but it was a really good uh measuring stick for just how balanced the league is. I mean, right. you know that BYU and Houston are not going to be too competitive, but I mean, you go to the lower third of the league, right? That would, I mean, that is so much stronger. Even the middle pack of the league is so much stronger in the big 12 than what you're going to see in the big 10 or in the sec. And so it's obviously it's kind of up for grabs um, at the top when you talk about K state and Utah, but there's, I mean, there's no reason why a team like West Virginia, UCF, or, you know, Iowa state, even some of these teams that are considered to be in that, you know, upper half, like even the, anybody can go out and win it. Right. Now, obviously it's a, it's a long shot for certain teams. Sure. But, and, and, and also with the uh, getting to the playoff, right. You don't have to win the big 12 to get in, right. You would hope and pray that the committee is going to be fair, right. If you played a tough schedule and you maybe lost an extra game or two, you know, looking at all things considered wins and losses is not the biggest way. It's not the best way to determine how good a team is. Right. right. Cole, you mentioned last year, like Oklahoma state got a pretty <laughs> favorable schedule to get yeah. to that big 12 championship game. And they got exposed against Texas. Right. And obviously I think Oklahoma state's a fine quality team that maybe is even getting overlooked next season. And so that's a great way to, to look at one year, against another it's just you, you can't look at what happened last year sure you can look at returning players and, and coaching stabs and home venues how much that can make an impact right guys but overall the, the portal and new guys coming in and out um, it changes year by year but that's what makes it so fun to follow so that I mean bottom line though is that the big 12 is just so competitive and it's open for anybody to win um, but that's what makes it fun right yep I agree I mean that episode we did of the big 12 insiders I think there's an indication that up to 10 teams are in realistic odds to win the conference. And there's fewer, even by percentage, uh, five digit odd teams, you know, 10,000 or above 
to win the conference as opposed to the Big Ten, SEC, or ACC. There's just fewer bottom dwellers down there in this conference. But it does kind of break off a bottom six when you look at odds, and then the top ten all seems fairly tangible. I mean, for example, would you guys be surprised if Iowa State finally puts it all together and makes a run to Arlington and wins? I wouldn't be surprised. No. Um, you know, I mean, we we really don't know what Arizona is going to – bring to the table with the new coaching staff, but uh, there seems to be an indication they could be pretty dang good. And maybe they'll roar through the conference. Uh, we just don't know enough about the PAC 12 schools where they fit in. So we'll find out pretty quickly. And when we start, you know, kind of matching them up on the field and see what happens. I will say the last thing I'll say before I read the next question, you asked, well, any team can win it. I'm going to tell you right now, Colorado is not one of those teams. And the only reason I even bring up the Buffaloes is because I don't know if you guys saw this or not, but I try to stay off of, you know, undisputed and first take or whatever it is, right? ESPN, Fox, but Skip Bayless absolutely loves Deion Sanders. And he had a pretty stupid comment, if I'll be completely honest, where he said that Shadur Sanders is the best quarterback in the country and can lead Colorado to a big 12 championship. Okay. He also said this. He yeah, also right. said he didn't know very much about their transfer portal class, and he wasn't exactly sure who all they had. But he can do it because Dion says he can. And that's the kind of perception that the Big 12 has to deal with from the national media, which right. to me to me, should just show how competitive this conference is going to be because people think that of the national media, and they're going to be shocked when Colorado wins five games. I. How does that guy have a show? How does that guy have this kind of standing in viewership? Because here we are talking he's about a, it. He's a total idiot. Yeah. He's built his career on being an idiot. Can you imagine? Uh, yeah, a lot of people watch me. Yeah, because you're an idiot. People watch monkeys throwing poop too. And that's basically what he is. He's the sports talk version of a crap throwing monkey skip bayless what a loser let's move on to the next question i'm just firing you up today fitz Uh, switching gears a little bit from adam k 63 he says is the men's basketball staff starting to balance their classes out a little bit better gills yeah fitz you did a a daily delivery on that right with sort of the it's there for them to do that and i did an article on wednesday couple of things that K-State sort of addressed, some issues they addressed, and one of those was um, a potential, right? It wasn't terrible after the season because you only had three returning guys, but the potential for a mess with your scholarship distribution moving forward, and there's four seniors, four sophomores, four juniors, and then there's that one freshman, David Castillo, and so it's very balanced. That's where you want to be, and so the, right now it's a it's the K-State's – scholarship chart is in a great spot. But if you have a mass exodus of all your players next off season, then you're right back to square one. And I'm sure that Jerome Tang and his staff, it was probably fun, right? You know, they embraced challenges and to go out and talk to these top prospects. I'm sure they had fun doing it, but to do that every off season, man, wouldn't you like to just have maybe four or five guys that you have to go after rather than eight, nine. And so you saw it in his first year. He had to do that taking over a brand new roster. He didn't want the the Weber players. He had to do that. He had to go out and get players. And then it sort of stabilized a little bit in the second year. But then last year, man, it, or excuse me, this offseason now, it's just, you know, they went out and got nine guys from the portal, including David Castillo. That's 10 newcomers, right? So I don't, if I was a coach personally, that's not where I would want to live, right? Exactly. You want to be much more stable and that that has been laid with the way they distributed this class and i i doubt it was a coincidence that it was 444 with those sophomores juniors and seniors yeah i i mean i agree with all that this like the dd said this is an opportunity for them to get some balance uh and in part because now this class is wrapped up for the first time and it's not spilling into august and they can go to Peach Jam and other events and start looking for dudes for the next few years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and maybe your biggest recruiting class now in terms of incoming freshmen will be three guys at most. But m- most years it might be two guys uh, so that you got plenty of flexibility with your transfer portal. But 
I think there comes a time when you've got to have guys that are coming in that can develop into your regular players, but it's hard to do because if you're trying to stay veteran through the portal, those guys aren't going to get great chances and they're going to go pout and leave and go somewhere else and maybe play more, but they probably would have played more at Kansas state in their second year also. So it's just kind of a strange situation you find yourself in with college basketball, but I do think they need a little more stability just for their own sanity where they're not having to reload year after year with the transfer portal. Yep. I agree with all that. Only thing I'll whatever add that- the whatever the issue is real quick with guys with, you know, RJ Jones or day day Ames guys that were maybe poised to have a, a prominent role on next season's roster, whatever the reason or issue was for them departing you, if you're K state staff, you need to learn from that, right? Can we communicate to these recruits when they're in high school better about what the plan is at Kansas state, what their roles might be the minutes or minutes that they're not promised, or is it what these players are expecting from Kansas state in return, right? NIL or what have you, I'm not going to get into what that issue may be, but having these guys leave and transfer out of your program, this better be a nice learning experience. uh, And you better learn something from those guys transferring out. So that doesn't happen again. Right. Cause I think we can all agree. We'd love to have Day-Day Ames and R.J. Jones still on that roster, right? Yeah, I would. I think Day-Day was a serious loss, and R.J., it was disappointing. I mean, I I think you can look at some of the guys that they brought in who wouldn't be here, and you'd say, okay, it's, it'd still be pretty good. It would know any different. But I think the coaches did a good job, at least on paper, of answering those questions. I, I think Day-Day is going to be real disappointed with his decision. I, I just don't see him playing huge minutes at Virginia. Uh, and he would have played minutes. Well, he was starting at Kansas State. Uh, I don't know if he would have continued to start, but he would have been a significant player. Well, like I was going to say, guys, really the only thing that's different um, is you have to have a plan. Every offseason you have a different plan of, plan of attack, right? Like these, this coaching staff understands that. They understand <laughs> that every year is going to look different. It just is. And you can't worry about what it's going to be like in 365 days. You have to worry about tomorrow. And um, with football, you can worry about what's going to, what it's going to be like in 365 days because you have 85 scholarships or however many, you know, whatever the roster size looks like. You can worry about that. If you lose three guys, you can replace them. If you lose three guys, it's a fifth of your roster in basketball. And so, yeah, I mean, you, you can't think about what's going to happen in 365 days. You have to focus on tomorrow. I think Jerome Tang and the staff understand that. Very good. Okay. Next question comes from B Foster one nine five nine of the three teams, football, men's basketball, and women's basketball, which one will finish highest in the big 12 standings? Got to get our crystal balls out here. B Foster with the thunder. I I mean, it's so the, the schedule, I know we don't know how teams are going to be right on the schedule, but as of right now, looking at the schedules first and I mean, I guess women's basketball can be competitive the more I, I think about it. But the like K-State men's basketball, they got a chance to be a pretty dang good team, right? With the Big 12 and, and hoops is just so tough. Brutal. And so K-State's football obviously has a very good team, but the schedule is very favorable as well. I got to go football. Well, you, you got to think about it like this too, guys. If K-State has a top – if they finish in the top five um, in the conference for basketball, are they a top four seed in the in the tournament? I'd be, top three yeah. maybe. Yeah, so, I mean, you're looking at maybe a top 15 team in the country. Uh, if K-State finishes fifth in the Big 12 for football, we're sitting here talking about a disappointment in a team that goes, what, eight and four? So, yeah. I mean, the expectations would feel completely different. Uh, I, th- I I think K-State could win the Big 12 for football, but I also think they can win the Big 12 for women's basketball. Um, I'm still going to say football and be with you on that, Gills, but, you know, maybe as far as, like, who is going to be more relevant in the national sense of the word um, throughout the entire portion of the season. I might pick women's basketball because I could see K-State being around the top 10 um, for most of the season for women's basketball, much like they were this past season. Not that they can't do that for football, but it's just so hard to do that in this version of the Big 12 for football because, oh, well, they if they beat a team, uh, they beat them. There's no marquee wins that K-State can really gain on their schedule because really another team beating them would be a marquee uh, would be a marquee win for that team. So it's really hard for K-State football to kind of catapult themselves into that national conversation because in part, they might be the team to beat. 
I'll go football. I don't know enough about Arizona, Arizona State, and Utah women's basketball. No plenty about Colorado. They eliminated K State. Mm-hmm. Um, losing Texas is a big hit in women's basketball. Oklahoma, Oklahoma too. Yeah, Oklahoma's pretty good. Uh, so I, I think the women could very well be the answer at the end of the day. But uh, I feel pretty good about K State's bat- football schedule, and probably honestly because that's the sport I'm studying right now. That's the one that's around the corner. And I feel like uh, K-State will be in Arlington, so one of the top two teams in the conference. Yeah. With 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 basketball, men's basketball, it's going to be very tough. K-State can beat Houston or KU or Baylor or Iowa State. They can win some of those games, but to be on a higher level, or I hate to say this, guys, until I can see what this transfer portal class can really do on the court, I'm not sure if K-State's in that Tier 1 level in in big 12 basketball men's basketball yet now i think they can get there if all things kind of go right and all the stars align but they're still kind of a a step away from being one of those top dogs in the big 12 in men's hoops i think that's fair yep totally fair last question of the podcast comes from gillam fan 67 663 probably a fan of uh hayden gillam if i were to guess uh, what's holding K-State football back from embracing alternate uniforms? No need to get too crazy, but the ice uniforms are absolutely fire. Ice and fire. And Fitz said in his daily delivery about sales increases between that and a recruitment standpoint, that should be enough of a reason, in my opinion, to quote-unquote break the curse. He also adds, I've always wanted to see all purple from helmets to pants. I'll oh, thank you on that. Um, I've seen that in this no no it's just too much uh i I think it's cultural i think there's enough people within the football building who still have the we don't need alternates genetics passed on by bill snyder and i think the players will push it and i think it's going to happen i don't i don't see this group of players led by avery johnson saying i want to play in the same uniform every week i i think they will want alternates they will the the key is not just to do an alternate make a big deal of it that's the problem schedule them like zach said exactly right baylor announces their uniform combos with a special schedule at the start of the year they know what they're going to wear at home and on the road every game by mid-august it's it's published it's no big deal and k-state just makes too big of a deal of it and it gets into everyone's head again like i said in the dd where are the all whites against ut martin First of all, you should you should be wearing your whites in August playing in Kansas. Uh, let the other team wear their dark jerseys in the heat. Uh, and if you lose that game, I will accept your argument that there's a damn curse. But until until that happens, uh, I'm I'm not going to believe that there's a curse. I just think they make too big of a deal about any little switch that the players just get overpsyched about it. Just make it more normal to do it two three times a year. Uh, and I'm not even asking for that much. If if you just use the white pants with the purple jerseys, you've got something new. I mean, you can have the, the traditional helmet, a purple version, a white version, and then maybe the Willie Pennant one or the K-State helmet that I want them to do. Uh, you know, maybe a lot of the alternate changes will just be helmets. I'd love to see a, an, an all gray uniform, but not the typical gray. I mean, I like the gray we use uh, that's got a little hint of purple in it. There's a lot of things they could do and stay within the framework. And you guys, I just did an Arizona podcast. It was really good. But they noted that there's one official color for the Kansas State Wildcats. It's purple. That's the only school color Kansas State has. Yeah, the white is in the in the theme song, but I don't want to hear lavender isn't a school color when the team wears silver silver all the time and it's not a school color. Um I, I think silver is the outlier here. I don't I think that's the color that doesn't belong in the palette. Uh, so we'll see what happens, but I think this group of players will, will bring K-State football into the more than norm. And I apologize if that makes the equipment room a little more hectic. I know Gilbert, you have a very strong opinion on this. Um, said with all sarcasm, um, but yeah, Fitz, I agree. Like, I think it would make a lot of sense to wear those all white uniforms at the very first game of the season. You talk about making it a big deal. Um, well, the first game of the season should be a big deal. And it shouldn't be about what you're wearing. So if you just uh, wear those good. uniforms, then people are more excited about the game than they are what you're actually wearing. Um, it would be really cool if they did that and had a whiteout on top of that. I think a lot of K-Staters would be grateful for that. 
Um, it's a night game. You're wearing white, so it's going to be 100 degrees outside. I think that solves a lot of people's issues about, you know, oh, I don't want to overheat. So if you're a white T-shirt, it's a little bit cooler. Um, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I also think that these kids want to wear alternate uniforms. Let's let's not forget that a lot of these older guys who were in the locker room the past few seasons who didn't want alternate uniforms were Snyder guys. Mm-hmm. Like not just the coaches, not just the people inside of that building, but the actual players, the quote unquote Snyder soldiers, as Daniel Green refers to that class as they're all gone now. And so those guys always, always, always wear and take photo shoots on their recruiting trips in alternate uniforms. That is part of the recruiting pitch. And then they get here and some of these guys have absolutely never worn alternate uniforms. Well, guess what? This year, it's going to happen. If you think Avery Johnson is just going to sit there and wear the same uniforms for the next two to three seasons, you are wrong. That's just not going to happen. So if you're one of those people that doesn't want alternate uniforms, you better just listen to the game on the radio when they play because um, it's coming and it's probably going to come pretty fast. Gills? I agree. You don't agree. You don't care about this topic. Okay. I I I I don't agree. I don't disagree. I just... Good stuff. Sure. Okay. I'm not going to watch on my, I'm not going to listen on the radio. I'm going to be there at the stadium for the game, even if they're in alternate uniforms. Let's, let's put it this way. The simple facts are when they wore the cat's helmet, that logo, that mark became really popular and people bought the crap out of it. Uh, we've seen a resurgence in the pennant Willie uh, popularity. I don't know if it's tied to when they wore it or not. When they started rolling out more and more lavender, fans literally can't get enough lavender. It sells out. I'll never accept the argument that lavender isn't a football color. That seems like a 1950s baby room argument uh, instead of actually talking about marketing your school. I'm telling you right now, K-State not leaning into lavender full bore is a huge mistake in marketing. That can be your identity is hints of lavender and lavender uniforms. I, I've seen some of the mock-ups of lavender tops. If, if you do it in the right shade of lavender, and I think basketball can get away with a more purple lavender, I think football needs a little gray lavender to it, it could be really striking and amazing looking. Amazing looking. Some of Mike Stanley's mock-ups are unbelievable. And I, I'm just... I'm disappointed that so many fans don't really care. So one fan responded, they got to stop losing it. The players got to stop losing in those uniforms. Avery Johnson's never had the opportunity to play in one. So because the guys before him had never won a game, uh, nobody can ever wear them. Just stop with this nonsense. Just it's, it's gotten to the point of being ridiculous. Uh, there's no superstitious reason why K-State loses in them other than the fact that we make too big of a deal. They're not cursed. And come on. You you want a cursed program? I was here before Bill Snyder arrived. It was cursed, and it didn't matter what uniform they wore, and that was true for season one of Bill Snyder. It didn't magically change with the Dallas Cowboy throwbacks. Um, I, look, I, I think they're great uniforms. They should remain the core, uh, but they're also uh, – I'm going to say it. When Al Serby goes on the record saying it's is it recognizable as Alabama or Ohio State or what? No, it's not, Al. It's not. It, that's just it's absurd. It, 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 look, it's a classic uniform. It's cool, but it's not Penn State, man. It's not, and nothing K State wears will ever be that. So why don't you bend the other direction and get, do some really cool things with your uniforms that make this generation of kids, the ones that are going to play the football games and grow up being K-State fans, why don't you engage them on that level and try to win the next generation instead of living in the old generation's reality? That's Very it. good. Good stuff. That, that's it. That's it for the Power Cat Podcast, sponsored by the Fridge Wholesale Liquor. I thought we were going to go longer, but – uh, Gills has no thoughts on this, and I have no thoughts on uh, that video game I keep mentioning. I should st- probably stop mentioning it. Mentioning it. That's it. We appreciate it so much. We've got so much more stuff coming this week. Uh, in all honesty, I thought it would be an incredibly busy week on the recruiting front. Cole, we're going to get some news here pretty soon. What's going on here? Just keeps dragging and dragging and dragging. And- you got people fired up with your daily delivery on Wednesday, so um, you know maybe that's delaying some things. Yep. Well, we'll, we'll find out 
here pretty soon on a whole bunch of recruits. I know they're trying to wrap up a bunch of stuff by the end of June. And well, we're almost at the end of June. And this podcast is also at its end. And we appreciate you watching. We're leaving now. This has been a GoPowerCat.com and Spirit Street production. Please support this show by subscribing to this YouTube channel or follow us on your favorite podcast platform.